And for the people of the Pacific, the Pacific is not a huge amount of ocean. It's just a really good highway with lots of bits of land in it. And they're really good at finding it. The other thing that they're going to be pretty confident of is that um, through the work of Jeff Irwin, that they probably, if they don't find it, they'll get home. They're actually exploring into the wind so that if food starts to get low, you can just flip the, the walker around and run for home. So we're out there. Now on board this walker, and that's I think the Hokulea, the big, um, the big Hawaiian uh, replica uh, walker, on board will be the whanau. There'll be the mothers, the fathers, the kids. They'll be largely um, sort of young, younger, fitter people. They will have with them their tools and these are boat builders, so that initially they've got an incredibly complex tool kit that's required for building uh, ocean going waka. They'll have their animals with them, they'll have their dogs and their pigs and their chickens. The other thing they'll have is they'll have the plants. The plants that they've successfully moved around the whole of their previous experience of exploring the Pacific. There'll be coconuts and breadfruit and taro and yams and kumara um, and a number of other tropical cultigens. They arrive in New Zealand. They arrive in this place that's completely different to anywhere else they've ever found before. In terms of Pacific Islands, it's continental in size. It's also a hell of a lot colder. It's also got a hell of a lot of meat on the hoof that they haven't ever met up with before. Um, it's got um, it's got large birds in large quantities, it's got seals in large quantities, it's got a completely untapped marine resource. I've worked on archaeological excavations in Northland um, that go back to the absolute first arrivals and what you're finding in the lower layers of those things are snapper jaws that for, are from snapper that are not a lot smaller than I am. The people fishing in a in an environment where no one has ever fished before. It is an incredibly rich place to arrive in. And when you arrive, there's a number of um, strategies that you can follow. Um, when you arrive at a place where there's no humans, there's a lot of surplus that you can live off. And some people appear to have headed south. There's a longer term strategy where you have to start gardening. And the problem in New Zealand is there's lots of things that don't grow that have been staples in the Pacific. Coconuts won't grow and that's really important because if you're a gardener and you've got pigs, the pigs have got to be fenced in. If you're fencing in your pigs and they're not wandering, digging up your gardens and wrecking your crops, you need a really good food source to feed them. Coconuts is what is fed to pigs in the Pacific. If your coconuts don't grow, there's not a lot of point in keeping the pigs, <laughs> especially when you've got seals on the beach and moa in the bush. The pigs go. There's so many birds, the chickens seem to go if they manage to get this far. The kuri, the dogs, survive. Dogs are useful for all sorts of things. They can be hunters' companions, um, as well as what I called in my kids' archaeology book, four-legged fridges. Um, the thing about pigs and dogs is that they eat much the same things that we do. So if you've got more food than you can eat and you haven't got a fridge, you feed it to the dog and then you eat the dog later on. It's a way of storing food. <laughs> now, the other thing these people have got is that they've got a hell of a lot of knowledge about gardening. They're not monoculturalists, they're not people who are growing just rice, just wheat, just corn. They're growing all sorts of vegetables. Now, I don't know if you can actually read that, but that's just a, a sort of a slice out of Māori words for soil. I mean, that is the level of complexity that you're dealing with. There's white clay, there's dark soil mixed with gravel and small stones, there's light, um, there's light soil, there's sandy soil, there's gravel, there's redder soil, darker soil. It's, it's these people are incredibly good at identifying the things that are going to be useful for them gardening. Now, when you've got your seedlings, you've got to move quick. Now what we've got here, um, this is Kumara in various forms. Um, it's a sort of an older one. The mounds are very sort of standard and that's that, out in the 
or two as Turk Tower Stonefields, I'll get onto those a bit later on, a sort of a development of the mound, the tipu, the little shoots that come off the kumara. In a world in which not much else would grow, taro grew but not particularly well, ufi yams grew but not particularly well, gourds grew, but what really grew was kumara, and why kumara grew was that it's not tropical, it's a temperate plant, picked up we're pretty darn sure from DNA now as well, by uh, Pacific explorers from South America and brought back into the Pacific. This becomes the staple crop of Aotearoa. But even then you're operating on the margins. It only grows well in the northern parts of the country and then you've got to maximise what you're doing. Um, and that's just some images of, of Kumara cultivation. Um, Storage pits were particularly, this is an invention that would have had to be developed in the Pacific, you can store kumara, we don't have to store it, you just dig it up when you want to eat it. In Aotearoa, if you leave it in the ground over winter, it, it, um, it rots, so this is actually a defended um, storage, it's, it's a part, it's just completely devoted to defended um, storage pits. Um, and they, they're just hakari stages which um, give an indication of the amounts of food that were, were being um, produced. This is, um, this is 19th century recordings, probably when new potatoes, new crops had arrived, but people had enough food at times of the year to do these huge displays. Okay, now it's time to get out of the voyaging walker and get into another walker. This is the, the, the Fox Moth aircraft that an early archaeologist in Auckland, Jeff Fairfield, used um, to photograph from the air a lot of the sites we're talking about today. He did it in the 1930s flying out of the Mangari Aerodrome. He recorded things like Mongataki Taki, which is now a hole in the ground. I remember seeing an application coming through when I worked at the Department of Conservation to actually take the quarry below water level, below sea level. It's not just an absence of a mountain, it's now a bloody big hole in the ground and you can see the extraordinary terracing, and that's, a, that's one of Jeff's photographs. Um, this is part of what was the Ellet block at um, Otuatawa. Um, it is an incredibly rocky landscape, and these photographs taken in the 30s were extremely useful when we were um, negotiating over the purchase. There were stories from some of the landowners that the rocks were nothing to do with Māori gardening, They'd been, they'd been put there by the Pākehā farmers. We could demonstrate that, in fact, um, this stuff had been there for somewhat longer. Another image of that. This is actually Pukatutu Island, and there's little bits of Wotua Tower that look like this. What we're looking at here are Māori field systems, um, low stone walls. What's happening is that people are looking for soil that is warmer and has abilities to be made warmer and manipulated to maximise kumara production. So, what you're dealing with initially when these people first arrive, and what's really useful and interesting about the, this landscape at Ultua Tower is that the archaeology and the tradition of the people who live there, the Māori people who live there, slots together really well. The, um, the place has um, stories of early arrival. It's the place where Hape, um, the club-footed uh, tuhunga who, who rode not a waka but a large stingray called Kaifari um, to Aotearoa. He, he, he waits and sleeps on this landscape waiting for the Tainui to arrive. The dates show that we are dealing with the very beginnings of human activity in Auckland. They arrive and find the soil that they can see is exactly what they're looking for. It'll be covered with bush. Um, we can see this process from looking at places like um, Rangi Toto. The bush is cleared. You then start tilling the soil. And for anyone who's actually dug here, when I first started working here as an archaeologist, I previously excavated either um, in sort of um, soils in Northland or in in Britain where it's just dirt basically. <coughs> what you're dealing with here is incredibly rocky soil and spades are hopeless. What's interesting is that very soon we discovered when we were excavating that it was really useful to dig with a big wrecking bar 
which is actually more like a coal, like a digging stick, than it is like a, a European shovel. Um, so these people are turning the soil over, and as they do so, they're bringing up stone. And as soon as they've got the stone, they have options as to what to do with it. And what they've done here, this is the most formal of uses. You can see they're clearing out either side to create these little field systems. Now, archaeologically, we're not entirely sure what's happening here. And this is why these places are so important. There's so many unexplained and unanswered questions or partially understood questions that that's why it's really important that they're protected so that we can keep sort of learning from them. Um, they may, may be to do with, with Fano groups, they might be to do with some sort of a fallow system because you're dealing with people, who, gardeners, who've got a very strong sense of tapu and noa which means that manures uh, which are used by gardeners in other parts of the world is not an option in the same way um, and so there's a whole lot of garden system and system workings that we don't completely understand. So but what the people are doing here, the stone's coming up and they're building little enclosures with it. Um, that's a more recent aerial which I must admit <coughs> is not quite as clear as I'd hoped for. In fact what we might do is move on, I think that's going to be a bit difficult to work with. Um, this is a, a, a sort of a low level photograph of um, another way that the people are operating in the old Tower Tower stone fields. We've got um, a sort of a lava ridge, a gully, another ridge, a sort of little plateau. And what people are doing here is they're actually tilling the soil in the gullies, they're removing the stone and they're stacking it on the ridges. You can see all that loose stone sitting on the top has been put there by people photographs of Māori garden walls running down that western side of North Head. In the middle here we have got the, the big um, volcanic field that's part of the, the, the Mount Victoria, the Takarunga um, ex, uh, ex, uh, eruption. And in here we have other signs of Māori garden structures. We've got clearance going on, we've got little stone enclosures, all of this now, of course, has been built over, but it's interesting that in other parts of Auckland it was probably all pretty much the same. Here it is again. Um, you can see the houses gradually creeping across it. Um, you can see there are structures. The, the, the Maori stone garden structures are quite informal, so you don't, you know, that we're not talking about sort of, um, you know, absolutely straight lines. Although in parts of the city. Um, that they ran for quite some distance, which, okay, um, this, of course, this is Māngari, um, and what's interesting about this is that the other thing that makes Otuatawa and the area around it so important is that in Auckland we've got this funny sort of um, mixture where to the north of the Manukau Harbour we've got quite a few of the volcanic cones but there's not a lot of the fields, the houses have lapped right up to the edges. In the south until recently we had quite a lot of the fields left but very few of the maunga, the mountains are gone, they've been quarried and this one is particularly important because it is actually um, the, one of the, the, the last sort of almost fully intact uh, volcanic cone in the area. It allows us to actually put the whole thing together. We can see the incredibly dense number of Ruakumara, the storage pits around the little crater there. Uh, there's an absolutely enormous Kumara pit there, which is right by one of the entrances, and I always think of it as sort of parking the Bentley at the front door, you know, as people, as visitors come through, you suddenly say, we are so rich that we can store this much Kumara. I mean, you could put tons of Kumara in that. What's interesting here is that the people are living on the southern side. They are gardening the warmer northern side. The whole thing is being geared towards food production. Uh, and that's a, a reconstruction that um, the Department of Conservation had done. Uh, so looking to the west, 
and that's a sort of a reconstruction of the landscape under full use. Um, now, why, why this is the remnants of Matukituru Wiri Mountain before it vanished into Porian? Because this shows us another way that this volcanic stone is being used. Um, in Pacific Islands, I know in, in Hawaii it's called Ahu Puaha. It's a way of dividing landscapes. And so normally in the Pacific, people are dealing with an island. And the, the, the centre of the island is like the hub of a wheel. And walls or boundaries run out like spokes so that people get access to all sorts of uh, resources. So they're getting the stuff on the high parts of the island all the way to the bottom of the, the wedge where they're getting um, access to the coast. And what we can see here are the remnants of the wall systems that once existed that ran out from this particular mountain um, across the landscape and um, Agnes Sullivan, an archaeologist in the 1970s, managed to um, identify examples of these walls that ran for over a kilometre, um, all completely destroyed now. Uh, the volcanic <coughs> field. Now, basically what we've got in Otua Tower is we've got a unique landscape that is for Auckland that is um, contains evidence of the first human activity in this part of New Zealand. We have got dates that go to the very earliest time. We have got possibly the first gardens that are being constructed. What we've got protected is the rough volcanic fields. What's not protected is the, um, the, the tough um, area to the east of the, of the reserve. The area that's going to be put into housing. Now, what we don't know is how people were using that land. What we do know is that they cleared it. Like the rest of the landscape in Tanaki, it had been cleared. People were gardening. Gardening in Auckland appears to intensify about 400 years ago. By that stage, the population is enormous. Radiocarbon dates are extremely common. We've got large numbers of people. And what worries me is that this housing development will take away a piece of this jigsaw, a page of the history, before we've even had a chance to have a good look at it. Um, and uh, while well, archaeology can in fact recover some information, working in front of a bulldozer is not the best way to do it. Also, given the, 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 the improvement in archaeological technique, um, we really, really do have to have some money in the bank. We have to have pieces of land that are protected for future examination when perhaps we have methodology that's improved on what's today. And I just pop this one in as the final slide um, just to show that when you least expect it, little bits of history will pop up and change the way you see things. This is an area about, it's part of an area about that square in the car park at the Navy Museum in Devonport. Basically the archaeologists were in there when they were building the museum and they'd been asked to identify 19th century Victorian um, defence structures. And they'd pretty much finished, they'd found cable runs and um, you know, the tram tracks and the way everything worked. When right in the corner, underneath the tarmac of the parking lot, they found a hangi. And around the hangi were clay pipes, and it's, there was a Maori settlement just next door in the 1860s. People were having a feed and having a smoke, and the pipes break and they're chucking them in the fire. Being archaeologists, we they kept digging. Underneath that was another one, no clay pipes there. Kept digging under that, another hangi. Yet again, no clay pipes. We're right back pre um, pre European contact. On top of that was what was, there's a whole lot of sand, gravel and bits and pieces um, but they kept on digging. Underneath that is the final honey in the, in the, in the sequence full of moa bone. Not moa bone that people are collecting to use industrially but moa that they're eating. This is one of the earliest sites in Auckland under a car park in a part of Auckland that has had people on it um, for the entire length of its use and a car park on top of that. 
it worries me that when we're dealing with these sites with early dates nearby, that we just wholesalely throw them away without having a decent look first. And that's the end of my rave. Thank you very much. <laughs>